everybody. This is Chris Morosky, and this is a short video on infertility treatments. The goals and objectives of this video are to understand some of the male infertility conditions that require assisted reproductive technologies, such as varicocele, Cartagener syndrome, and cystic fibrosis, to understand some of the female infertility conditions that also require assisted reproductive technologies, such as pelvic inflammatory disease and endometriosis. We will then review intrauterine insemination, ovulation induction, and in vitro fertilization. So first to talk about some of the uh, male infertility uh, conditions that require assisted reproductive technologies. First we'll discuss varicocele. Varicocele is a varicosity of the testicular pampiniform plexus. This can be seen in both the right and or left testicle, uh, but is more common um, on the left side. Um, the diagram shows um, a normal testicle on the left on hand picture uh, with swelling varicosity um, causing a varicocele in the right-hand picture. Um, for both uh, sides, there is often poor venous um, valves uh, within the testicular vein, and this allows uh, backflow of blood back into the um, area of the spermatic cord. Um, particularly on the left-hand side, there's two conditions which make um, left-sided varicocele more common. The first is that the left testicular vein um, communicates with the left renal vein, um, and this is really a right angle communication, and this uh, right angle can uh, cause further uh, venous return um, back into the um, uh, varicocele. Um, also, there's a nutcracker effect where the uh, left renal, uh, left testicular vein um, is um, sort of compressed uh, in between the uh, aorta and superior mesenteric artery. Um, with the presence of a varicocele, there is an increase in inter intratesticular temperature. And for men with this condition, there's a wide range of infertility. Uh, many men that have this condition um, have no infertility, um, but some men can have um, up to complete azospermia, meaning absent um, sperm production. The next, uh, the next um, cause of male infertility is uh, a syndrome called Cartagener syndrome. Uh, this is a form of primary ciliary dyskinesia. Uh, this is a rare autosomal recessive defect in ciliary action. As can be seen in the diagram, um, the problem here is that there is absent central pair microtubules of the normal modal cilia. Um, and this causes the cilia to rotate in a clockwise fashion um, rather than beat. For approximately 50% of patients with primary ciliary dyskinesia, um, there is Cartagener syndrome, which includes also situs inversus, chronic sinusitis, and bronchiectasis. Um, and unfortunately for males with this condition, immodal sperm is often the norm. Next is cystic fibrosis. Uh, cystic fibrosis an, is an autosomal recessive disorder resulting in impaired chloride anion transport into sweat, digestive juices, and mucus. Um, and this causes thickening um, of these uh, fluids. Uh, in men, there is infertility in greater than 90%. 98% uh, due to congenital absence of the vas, vas deferens, and this happens to usually be bilaterally. Um, sperm production is also um, commonly abnormal, but the big problem here is that no sperm can reach the urethra uh, because there is no vas deferens. To talk quickly about female infertility that requires assisted reproductive technologies, we're going to talk about two forms of tubal factor infertility. The first is pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease is often caused by an ascending infection of gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, these sexually transmitted infections uh, first inhabit the cervix, but these can ascend up through the endometrial cavity into the fallopian tubes where a larger infection can um, happen. Um, these, this is often very damaging to the fallopian tube. Um, in the uh, diagram on the right, you can see a large swollen fallopian tube, which is likely filled with infection and pus. Um, this uh, infection is often treated initially with IV antibiotics, um, but if patients don't get better, the abscess or uh, infection is large. It sometimes requires either surgical drainage or complete removal of the fallopian tube. And for fallopian tubes that are left behind, there is often uh, damage, which can result in fallopian tube occlusion. Similarly, endometriosis uh, can also cause fallopian tube um, problems. Uh, endometriosis is when the endometrial stroma and glands um, are found outside of the endometrium. Uh, the common areas where endometriosis is found is on the ovaries, in the ovarian fossa and the pelvis, and on the fallopian tubes. 
uh, due to the um, inflammation from the endometriosis, there can be fallopian tube scarring um, and also um, fallopian tube occlusion. All right, moving on to some of the forms of assisted reproductive technologies. Um, the first is intrauterine insemination. Um, for intrauterine insemination, first the male ejaculate is collected, um, and this can come from either the um, woman's partner or from a donor. Um, the, the menstrual cycle is often timed or stimulated uh, so that um, the sperm can be inseminated um, at the uh, proper time. Um, in the menstrual cycle around ovulation. Um, also for intrauterine insemination, the semen is often washed um, to uh, reduce cramping from prostaglandins, um, as prostaglandins cause cramping of the myometrium. This also um, helps with expulsion of the semen from the endometrial cavity. Um, washed sperm can also um, concentrate the uh, modal sperm, and so that there are issues with sperm motility, intrauterine insemination can sometimes overcome this. Um, intrauterine insemination does increase the probability of conception, um, but it does require normal ovulation and patent fallopian tubes. Moving on to controlled ovulation induction. Um, controlled ovulation induction um, is done primarily through two separate medications, which are taken as pills. Uh, the first is clomiphene citrate, uh, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator and um, at the level of the pituitary, it acts as an estrogen antagonist. The other, the other medication is letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor. Um, if either of these medications are taken in the earlier follicular phase, such as through uh, days uh, three through seven or days five through nine, this can increase pituitary FSH production. Um, and this FSH recruits more follicles towards follicular genesis and eventually on towards ovulation. And finally, um, we'll review the uh, several steps of in vitro fertilization. Um, the first step is uh, something called ovarian hyperstimulation. First, patients usually have their menstrual cycle um, either, uh, either shut down with either birth control pills or a GNRH agonist or antagonist. Um, patients then undergo daily injections of follicle stimulating hormone, um, which sometimes also contains luteinizing hormone, um, but certainly requires the FSH. Patients are brought in and monitored with pelvic ultrasounds and serum hormones um, daily or every other day. Um, around the time of the LH surge, so about 10 to 12 days into the cycle or when the follicles have grown to approximately 20 millimeter size, the patients are given a HCG trigger. The human chorionic gonadotropin um, is very similar to luteinizing hormone um, and has a similar effect of the LH surge. Uh, this helps complete the first uh, meiotic division. Uh, there is an expulsion of the first polar body, and there's an arrest at metaphase two. Um, at this time, some uh, at this time, a GnRH agonist such as luprolide can also be given uh, to prevent ovulation because ovulation is not what you want here. Um, it is important to note that um, these injections of follicle stimulating hormone um, carries an approximately thirty percent risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, approximately 34 to 36 hours after the HCG trigger, um, the patient comes in for an egg retrieval. Um, this needs to be done before ovulation. Um, patients are brought in and placed to sleep under anesthesia. A transvaginal ultrasound probe is then placed, um, and a long um, aspiration uh, needle is passed under ultrasound guidance to aspirate the fluid from the um, ovarian follicles. The oocytes are then uh, collected and placed in an embryo culture media. The oocytes are then brought to the embryology lab where they are um, put together with sperm. There's kind of two ways to do this. The first is called co-incubation. Um, this is where um, sperm is mixed uh, directly, or this is where washed sperm is mixed directly with the egg. Um, the ratio here is approximately 75,000 to uh, sperm, 75,000 sperm to one egg. Um, the other alternate is to um, perform something called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Um, this can be done for very low sperm counts because all you need is really one sperm. Um, here, the sperm is injected directly into the cytoplasm um, of the oocyte. Uh, successful uh, fertilization is documented by seeing two um, pronuclei, one from the male and one from the female. Uh, these um, early embryos are left in culture until either day three, which is called the cleavage stage, or day five, which is called the blastocyst, 
blastocyst stage. Um, day five embryos are more likely to um, implant um, and to move on to successful pregnancy. However, um, there is wastage or loss of the embryos going from day three to day five when they're left in the culture media. Um, on either day three or day five, the embryos are transferred through a small catheter which is passed through the cervix uh, into the uterus. Uh, the follow-up for these patients after embryo transfer um, is to have some form of uh, luteal phase support with exogenous progesterone and often estrogen. This is particularly important for patients who don't have an immediate or what's called a fresh cycle um, embryo transfer. Many patients will um, have the um, embryos frozen um, allow their bodies to return to a normal physiologic state, um, be ramped up for um, the transfer so that there is receptivity of the endometrial lining, um, and therefore cobra sluting is not formed, and so these patients are often given uh, the progesterone um, at least until 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy. Um, following the uh, transfer of the embryo more immediately, um, patients come in for a serum, um, HCG, or pregnancy levels, um, and this can be done uh, eventually um, through urine pregnancy tests once the HCG levels are highest. Um, approximately five to six weeks after transfer, um, an early transvaginal pregnancy ultrasound is performed, uh, and what we're hoping for is what you see in the picture on the right, uh, and that is uh, an intrauterine pregnancy. You see the larger gestational sac. Uh, the small smudge where the arrow is is the early embryo, and next to that is the yolk sac. Uh, once a heartbeat is seen, the embryo is approximately 67 weeks. Um, patients are then transferred to the obstetrician for prenatal care. There are some risks of in vitro fertilization. This includes ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, um, which we discussed briefly before, but this occurs in approximately 30% of patients undergoing IVF. Um, there are mild, moderate, and severe forms but this does include swelling of the ovary with multiple follicles, leakage of um, uh, fluid into the peritoneal cavity, contraction of the vac vascular space, increasing hematocrit and increasing the risk of uh, thrombosis. Um, and every now and then this can result in um, severe morbidity um, and even death. Um, there's also a risk of uh, multiple gestation. The picture here shows um, early diamniotic dichorionic twins. Um, this risk goes up with the number of embryos uh, that are transferred, but there's also a risk of embryo splitting, um, increasing the risk of twins. Uh, there's also an, a risk of ectopic pregnancy. Um, when the um, embryos are transferred into the endometrial cavity, there's some pressure here, and the embryos can be pushed up into the fallopian tubes. Um, also, there's concern about birth defects following um, IVF. Um, certainly, there's um, pretty well documented risk of cardiac defects in the offspring, um, but also um, cleft palate, some spine formation, and bowel issues as well. Um, and there's a lot of studies being conducted um, currently on the long-term risks of um, IVF offspring, including um, increased risk for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, depression, and other things. And it's very important to note, finally, that in vitro fertilization is quite expensive, costing greater than $10,000 per single cycle. So just going over um, the talk, hopefully everybody got a good understanding of the male and female infertility conditions, or a few of them at least, that require assisted reproductive technologies. We also were able to discuss entry and insemination, ovulation induction, and in vitro fertilization. Good luck with your studies, and we'll be seeing you in class soon. Take care.